I am a herder, not a hoarder, but a herder. I love bringing people together. My primary responsibility here at Boston College is to guide and direct and achieve consensus community with the Boston College marching band. So given that background and these expectations, that's really become my life's work. And music is a medium, but I have a sense that if it weren't music, I'd find some other way to try to draw people together and build a sense of community. With that said, I, like many of you, have been troubled deeply by what I perceive to be lots of divisions on all sorts of different directions within the broader society today. And I picked three themes that I wanted to discuss with you today, three ways that we kind of bracket people off or sometimes they self-segregate themselves. Uh, in ways that we might be able to break down some of those saws to achieve consensus. The first is race. The second one is defined along gender. And the third broad category we'd like to look at is um, uh, divisions along religion. So in trying to make sense of all of those categories and how we can sort of hang on to what's important to our identity but achieve that consensus, I looked for some common threads. And what I found in most of the readings and interpreting is that most of the people who are talking about these issues are educated in some way or another. That is to say, they've received an education. How is it possible that today we still have all of these barriers that are predicated upon race, gender, and religion? How have we not moved past that? You would think if we were de designing an education system from scratch, one of the core objectives would be to establish a sense of equity. So I've come to this sort of inescapable question, that is it possible uh, that our system of education, and higher education in particular, is actually unintentionally perpetuating racism, gender discrimination, and religious intolerance? One of the initial priorities that we discover when we're starting grade school is discernment. It's a fundamental core building block of how we learn. We discover the difference between right and wrong, uh, good and bad, hot and cold, up, down, and so forth. And we're rewarded for that. We're, the ability to identify differences is an important core tenet in how we learn. And as we go through school, we learn to establish that differences or identify differences along more nuanced lines. And this is an actual phrase. This is, some of you are way too young to remember this, but back in the day, of my generation, there was this, it's almost become a meme now, in Sesame Street, that would say, one of these things is not like the other, one of these things just doesn't belong. <laughs> For an adult to look at it and say, it makes perfect sense. There's three red hats and one silver hat. That's the one, that's the outlier, that's the one that doesn't belong. To a kid, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily able to distinguish yet what are inanimate objects that doesn't belong in animate objects like people or animals or the like. We just, we're, we're awarded and rewarded by our ability to pick out the thing that doesn't belong. And that's perpetuated again. That's the thing. Single out the thing that doesn't belong. Identify the thing that doesn't belong. On standardized tests, you do that well enough, you'll score high. You go to a good college. So as you go through middle school and high school, we have this grappling ability with like these things that don't belong, and we're trying to find ourselves, our sense of purpose. Like, where do I belong? Because as much as we all want to have our own individual identities, most of us kind of align in certain categories that can be described by others. We're a tribal species. Nobody really wants to be the outlier that, that everybody else ignores. We want to be inclusive. We want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Harvard University, the roots of higher education in the United States, founded in 1636. Um, if you were to look inside Harvard University, you would find some interesting characteristics of the students in the 17th century. Number one, they're white. Number two, they're male. Number three, more likely than not, they're Puritan. So even in the roots of a system of higher education, we have restrictions based on race, gender, and religion. Here it is in 2018, 382 years later, and we still have institutions of higher education whose missions are specifically to serve students of a specific race, gender, religion. And there's all sorts of data out there, and they're right, that say there are benefits to an inclusive environment. That's true. And you may even have somebody said, listen, I attended one of those schools, and I'm great. That's probably true as well. That was important. But the problem is we don't always achieve equity among students at a critical time in their formative development. And even for the schools that try to serve st all students equally, we have clubs and organizations that are largely aligned, many of them, along race, gender, and religion as well. Now, that's beneficial in providing an environment for students at a critical transition in their lives, many of them living at home, uh, away from home for the first time, trying to find them se their sense of self, where they belong, their sense of identity. It's critically important that we have that environment so they can feel that they're a part of something greater than themselves. 
And it's also cr critically important that we maintain that cultural identity and that we study our past, learn from it, advance it, and use it for advocacy if those needs aren't being addressed. But the problem is, in some cases for some students, they become so deeply and narrowly drawn into these categories, whether by their own choice or maybe they're coerced into it or they feel pressured, that they begin to more narrowly define themselves in those characteristics. And that's dangerous because in those cases, they aren't able to see many of the commonalities that exist with other students. And there's not a lot of supervision that goes to that as well. So as students, if they do become mired down and pulled down, it's what um, my good friend Ag Admiral Akbar might call a trap. <laughs> For those students, they aren't able to interact and engage within the broader university community. And there's not necessarily a mecha mechanism in place to do that. So think about it. When we talk about diversity in our college campus, we're talking about the admission statistics, the profile of students who are, who are attending the institution. And you could picture an administrator at a college university looking out from an ivory tower window and surveying the landscape of the university saying, look at this amazing diversity. I mean, we have clubs for everyone. And on one hand, that's great. But who is coordinating the efforts of those clubs? That's like hiring a contractor to build your home. He shows up with a dump truck, and he unloads cement and beams and girders and nails and hammers and windows, and he says, how do you like your new house? Like, well, I actually don't. I don't I'm not quite satisfied yet. Like, all the important pieces are here. I get it. These, I need all these pieces. They're super valuable. But you haven't connected anything. You haven't built anything. And that isn't necessarily yet a core objective of higher education. And that's really the critical distinction that, that we, I think we as a society, but particularly within higher education, need to address to advance our students and create a brighter future for them. So how do we do that? There's two core themes in education. One is dissonance, one is complexity. Dissonance, just like in music, is the sort of unsettled feeling that moves people from one place to another. We seek a resolution. We grapple with something difficult. If it's a new concept, we, we struggle with it for a while, and then it, we make sense of it, and that creates complexity in our mind. And that complexity stays in our mind, and it fuels the next cycle of dissonance to complexity, dissonance to complexity. And over time, you achieve higher-order thinking. And higher-order thinking manifests itself in lots of different ways. It might be critical thinking skills, it might be math or science or logic skills, but it's also the way we engage with each other, how we treat each other, how we respond to each other, how we love each other. So let's put our theory to the test. We administered a survey to 1,882 March Man students at 20 colleges and universities all around the country, and we compared the survey results with 6,095 non-band students at those same schools. And we evaluated, this is a survey that's administered to, it's been over 3 million students since 2000, so it's the most widely implemented survey of its kind. And uh, we found three interesting areas in particular, three recurring themes. First is engagement with diversity. The second is reflective learning. And the third is personal social responsibility. Engagement with diversity. This has to do with the frequency with which students have conversations with somebody of a different race, ethnicity, culture of their own, or a different political ideology, uh, religion, et cetera. And what we find is that the March to Ban students that we surveyed, to a statistically significant degree, indicated greater engagement with diversity than the non band students. That's important because it's the first ingredient in our formula. That's the dissonance. Okay, so let's test it again. If we have dissonance, we should start to see some complexity forming. We see that in terms of reflective learning. Reflective learning is the frequency with which students try to imagine someone else's perspective to understand it better. Or they try to reevaluate their own position, evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of what they know. Or they try to put it all together and learn something new about a subject or a topic they hadn't thought of before. That's reflective learning. And again, we found the March Man students, to a statistically significant degree, indicated greater reflective learning than the non-band students. Those in and of themselves are important. It's not quite done. There's a foundation, a platform, but it's a sort of so what or what, what happens from there. From there, we see personal social responsibility. That manifests itself in an array of characteristics. The first is developing a personal code of ethics and values. Understanding yourself understanding someone of a different racial ethnic background, learning effectively on your own, voting in local, regional, national elections, uh, committing to uh, community affairs and developing a complex set of community skills, 
and then finally being committed to solving complex real world problems. And this is the, the crux of why we send students to college today, regardless of your major or your interest. These seven characteristics are the fundamental outcomes of a higher education. That is to say that whether you want to be an engineer or a nurse or scientist, an architect, whatever it is that you want to do, you should be able to embody these skills, these attributes, these characteristics. Again, we find to a statistically significant degree, the March Men students demonstrated or indicated greater personal social responsibility than the non-marching men students. And that's not even the best of it. For the statisticians among us, you'll say, well, okay, this is impressive, but causation, correlation, we don't know this is what's fueling all of this, and that's correct, we can't say for sure. We, we don't know if the March Men participation causes these results, but we do know there's a strong correlation. And we took into account as many of the pre-existing and co-existing characteristics as we could to try and piece it apart. So we looked at the student's gender, race, first generation status, the student a, uh, ACT, SAT score. We took into account whether the student was already involved in the learning community, had conducted volunteer work, had conducted research with a faculty member, whether the student was a varsity athlete, whether the student was in a fraternity or sorority. We even took into account the student's academic major, an array of characteristics to try and piece it apart and say, okay, what percentage of these, or what factors are contributing to this end result, these desirable characteristics? And what we found was of all of those individual characteristics, the strongest predictor of students indicating these personal social responsibility skills was participation in the college marching band. That's important, so it begs the obvious question, how does this happen? Well, it's a pretty demanding and grueling activity. Um, we taught the first item I bring up is the 200 hours in a single semester. That's significant because that's as many hours as a full course load. So these students are spending, you can think about all the courses you take, add up the total number of hours, the band students are spending that many hours together within the marching band environment. The camp alone is 80 hours of rehearsal time, the preseason camp. Then there are rehearsals and performances that, that continue out throughout the fall semester. So it's highly demanding. It's out of class engagement. Just like a lecture hall setting, it's valuable. You can learn a lot, but you're not necessarily engaging with each other right now. We're having a discussion that's really sort of bilateral, but it's not across multiple realms. So the opportunity to have students come out of their classrooms and engage with each other freely, crossing lots of cultural, racial, gender, ethnic lines, religious lines, and discovering each other is incredibly valuable. It's educationally purposeful. There are tasks and requirements at the end of it that are occurring at a high tolerance. The precision, for those of you who are musicians, or for those of you who have done anything with the kind of tight tolerances of navigating 180 people in a fixed space, moving around, making music, performing dance, is difficult. So it's a high-intensity task, and guess what? It's also the most public of any on the university campus. If you perform with the marching band, more of your peers and community members will see you perform in that single day than most of your other students will have seen perform in the four years that they're at a university. It's also under the supervision of caring and attentive mentors. My students would dispute this. However, <laughs> there are many other staff members within our program who are attentive to the needs of students. And it's more than just the rehearsal time we spend together. On the, when the rehearsal ends, we're walking back with the students to the hall. We make ourselves available. I have this thing with our students, and I invite you as well, if anybody has some thoughts uh, following the talk, to come in and have tea with me. There's no better way to learn about somebody else than just sit down, remove the distra distractions, and have a conversation to try and understand one another. And then this is a recurring theme in the literature, the blend of challenge and support. That is to say that it's difficult but it's attainable. The support, that staff structure matters. We need both of those in equal tandem. It's easy to sort of settle into something that's, that's comfortable for you, but that's not the purpose of higher education. The whole point of higher education is to come outside your comfort zone. David was just talking about that. The whole purpose is to come outside your comfort zone, and the market room provides that format. Okay, so more significantly, and the last sort of question I have is, why does this matter? Well, it matters for a couple reasons. Firstly, if you have a student who's going to college, he or she should be in the marching band. That's the first thing, okay? And they're welcome to join our band as well. But the second reason it matters is we can use this as a template. This is not, this is not original or new. In many ways, this is just a sort of construct of putting lots of pieces together and just happens to be almost a perfect storm of productivity in terms of student development. But this is a formula that can work and be applied in different settings. But what you need to have is shared values. So it's a community with shared values despite all of the differences. An earned sense of identity. And this is a big one, too. We're born on this planet with a certain set of characteristics that, we're gonna, that are going to remain with us, most of us, for the rest of our lives, give or take, and there's some, some fluidity with some. But for the most part, if you're still defining yourself by those characteristics at 22 years of, old, of age when you graduate from college, 
there's a problem. Like your education system has failed you. If you're still defining yourself solely by birth characteristics at 22, you haven't fulfilled your obligation. Education hasn't fulfilled its obligation to you. Third is a, a sense of community, the sense of coming together. You have shared priorities, shared resources, a limited amount of time to do something constructive. And when we start to see as ourselves as global citizens, we, we tend to care more about each other because we have shared interests. It's in my interest for you to be successful because our success depends on all of us being successful. Collaborative achievement, this is coming to for students to define themselves in different ways, and then in band, they find new ways. So, for example, I might come from whatever background, but when I come into band, I'm a trumpet player. And I'm a trumpet player next to this trumpet player, and this trumpet player, and this trumpet player. And they may have other characteristics, but because our work is all about this and our responsibility along this realm, I've got to learn very quickly to mitigate some of those differences. And in the process, I do find a sense of commonality, and I do find a sense of mutual shared values. And then the last one, and perhaps the most significant at all, is preparation for, for engaged citizenship. I mentioned those seven personal social responsibility characteristics, and I really do believe those are the fundamental core objectives of our higher education. If we are truly committed to those ideals, if we are truly committed to achieving equity, respect within the broader community, it has to happen within the realm of higher education. Higher education is not about knowledge acquisition. If I were interested solely in learning something new, I'd watch TED Talks all day. I, I would, I'd watch Khan Academy, I'd go to Coursera and edX. There's lots of online resources for me to learn stuff very quickly at my, at my own pace and my own timeline. It's not the point. The point of higher education is to come together in a community to discover those shared values. And it is my assertion and belief that higher education may be our last best hope to prepare students for engaged citizenship in an increasingly diverse democracy. This is just one model that might help us get there. Thank you for listening.